Hi, welcome back to video number seven in Data Science Dojo's series on Introduction to Text Analytics with R. I am your host, Dave Langer. So what we have here is in our environment, in our studio environment, with all the code ran, executed through the end of video number six. And if you recall, at the end of video number six, what we did was we created bigrams. So we added both unigrams and bigrams into our feature matrix, and what we got was a very, very large matrix. So you can see here we have a new, our new training set as a result of having both single tokens, single individual words, as well as bigrams, that is two words that are right next to each other, gives us a data frame of size 3,901 rows and 29,298 variables. And we finished last time talking about how this is a very indicative problem of text analytics, this curse of dimensionality problem, which is it's very easy to explode your feature space. This is very common, where you will have data frames with rows that are far less in number than your columns. So that's actually very common in text analytics, especially when you start adding uh, n-grams, so unigrams, bigrams, trigrams, etc. And then we also discovered as well is that what happens is that these individual columns, we explode out our data frames. They get very, very wide. So we have lots and lots of columns, but for the most part, the columns are essentially empty. We saw, for example, that our data frames were 99.9% .9 sparse, which means that 99.9% .9 of the cells essentially have values of zero in them because there was no signal in the data. Uh, another way to think about this is, is that any particular, if you want to think about it from an, uh, a bigram or a trigram perspective, any particular combination of two words uh, right next to each other, or three words right next to each other, is going to be far less likely across all of the documents, all of the rows in your data frame. Ergo, it makes sense that most of the values would be zero, would be empty, because there's not a, a, there's not a large number of intersections of documents with particular word combinations. That's very typical in text analytics. Uh, so text analytics suffers very much from the cursed dimensionality problem. We'll talk more about that in the slides that we'll be going through later in this video. Okay, so as promised last time, so we've got this new data frame, but what did it do actually to the performance that we saw uh, in our modeling efforts? For example, we've been using for the sake of argument single decision trees so far in the video series, mainly because they're easy to understand and they train fast. It's purely the only reason why we've been using them is, is, is a, essentially is just as a device to understand what's going on in terms of uh, the efficacy, the effectiveness of our representations of our textual data. So not surprisingly, uh, following the pattern of the video, we can go ahead and actually do some code to actually train a single decision tree using tenfold cross-validation, repeated three times, using seven different parameter values to try and find a really good performing tree. Now the problem is, though, as I mentioned last time, is you start running into scalability. So you'll notice that the code that we'll look at right now is all commented out. And the reason for that is this. This right here. So I ran this code originally on a 10-core workstation. So a workstation with a lot of RAM. It has 10 virtual processors on it. So it's a beefy machine, and it took 38 gigs of RAM, approximately, and more than four and a half hours to execute. So that gives you some idea of the sense of scale. If you don't have a really big machine, then doing the kinds of things that we're doing, robust cross-validation using the entire uh, sparse data frame, can lead you to some scalability issues. Now, the good news is in this day and age of the cloud, this is not that big of a deal. It's, it's trivial to go out to Amazon EC2 or go out to... Microsoft Azure, rent yourself a fairly large VM. Um, for example, you can get VMs in Azure that are 16 virtual cores, 116 gigs of RAM. They cost around 350 an hour to rent. So I mean, you could you could rent one for maybe 20 bucks and do this if you wanted to. So in this day and age of the cloud, you know the scalability concerns are not nearly as 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 concerning as they used to be. But I just wanted to give you some sense of what's going on. So you can, if you'd like, you can go ahead and uncomment all this code and run it. Just be aware that you're going to need a big beefy machine and quite a bit of time to actually get it all to execute. But for the sake of argument, for the sake of discussion, I've gone ahead and just summarized what we got out of the, um, the results here. And you'll notice that uh, the run that I did actually decreased the accuracy, decreased the effectiveness of the model slightly. 
you'll remember that um, previously with a unigram matrix of TF-IDF values, we were around 94.7 was our um, about our accuracy for a single decision tree. When we added the bigrams in, it actually went down slightly, just 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 a skosh, just a bit. Now, that's not uncommon. So I will mention this. Uh, if, if As many of my students, my boot camp students can attest, uh, we tend to use the term, it depends a lot in answers to lots of questions. For example, Dave, will bigrams always improve my model? And the answer is, it depends. This is a good example of that. In the case of this particular process, which is tenfold cross-validation repeated three times using a single R part decision tree tuned over seven parameters using caret, the answer is no. Adding the bigrams actually decreased the effectiveness a bit based on this measure. However, and we'll see this later on in the video series, this is super important, is that while the addition of bigrams affected a single R part tree, it actually will help out a lot for when we move to a more sophisticated model, notably the mighty random forest. So that's where the depends comes in. Certain models maybe it will hurt and certain models maybe it will help. So you just need to test this all out. And as my students can also attest, I will argue this is a good thing because this is job security. If you knew all of this stuff a priori, what was going to work and what wasn't, then it could be commoditized and automated, which to, to, as of the time of this recording, it cannot. So this is part and parcel of being a data scientist is understanding the tools at your disposal, exploring them, understanding the trade-offs, and then using the right tool for the right job. As it'll turn out, adding bigrams to our feature matrix is actually the right tool for this particular job, and we'll see that later on in the series. Okay, so moving on. So what we've got now is a problem. We have this very, very large data frame. As you can see here, it took us an awful lot of RAM and an awful lot of time on a pretty beefy machine to actually just work with this data. And what we know is that it's sparse too. So we get this double whammy of, you know, we're taking lots of RAM and we're taking lots of time to execute and we're, most of the data that we're working over is zero. So it's almost like kind of wasted effort. Now the good news is, is that we have tools at our disposal to help us with this to say, look, you know what, you've got this raw data, these 3,901 rows of 29,298 columns of TF-IDF, unigram, and bigram goodness. What more can we do with it to actually improve what's going on? And the answer is, is that we're going to do latent semantic analysis, or LSA, using a technique called singular value decomposition, which is a matrix factorization technique that allows us to implement feature reduction or feature extraction. And that was a lot of shock and awe terminology, and I did that by design, hopefully to get your attention. But it's actually not as difficult as you may think. So with that, let's go ahead and bust out into some slides so we can actually understand what's going on and how we can improve this representation, how we can simultaneously make it smaller so that way we can use more robust algorithms like the random forest with it, while simultaneously also improving the representation of the data so that the columns that we get are actually far more feature rich, they're far more signal intensive than these highly sparse 29,298 columns. Okay, so let's bust out some slides. Okay, so before we dive right into LSA and SVD and that sort of thing, let's talk a little bit about our progress so far because that's gonna set the context, the conceptual context. So we've made a lot of progress. We've created representations of unstructured text data in formats that are amenable to all types of analyses and most importantly for the construction of machine learning models. That's pretty important. So we've also shown how you can build essentially a de facto standard data preprocessing pipeline that can be the starting point for easily 80% or more of your text analytics projects. We've also shown how we can take the base bag of words representation and we can make it even better by using the mighty TF-IDF calculation. And then lastly, we've also extended the bag of words model, the initial unigram model, with word ordering by incorporating things like bigrams and trigrams and foregrams and so on and so forth. How ngrams allows us to ex expand the feature capabilities of bag of words representations by adding word ordering. But here's the thing. We've also, we've also encountered some problems, some notable problems. First and foremost, 
as we add n-grams in particular, our document term matrices explode to be very wide. Lots of columns, right? We just saw how we have over 29,000 columns in our unigram and bigram uh, representation. So this is very, very common. And we've also, we also discussed they don't, con they don't contain a lot of signal, right? They're sparse. As a result, we're running into scalability issues like RAM and huge amounts of computation. Building single decision trees in four and a half hours on a 10-core workstation, I mean, that's, you know, that gives you some sense of scale of what we're talking about. And then all of this basically translates into what we call the curse of dimensionality, which essentially is that as, as, these, as these data frames get very, very, very large, there's all kinds of implications that go along with it, right? not the least of which, quite frankly, is essentially just the computational aspect. They just take a long time to crunch through to build your models. And anything that slows you down as a data scientist is bad. Quick iteration is key for driving the most business value as a data scientist. So cursor excuse me, cursor dimensionality is something that you really much you very much need to pay attention to in text analytics. But here's the good news, right? This is all not gloom and doom. Everything that all the progress that we've made allows us to use what is known as the vector space model. And we'll discuss what that means in a in a second. But this this vector space model representation, which is essentially what our bag of words model um, gives us, allows us to address a lot of these problems. And we'll discuss how we're going to do this in the, in the future slides. OK. But first, let's talk about the vector space model. So here's the core intuition, right? And this should make sense. Think about this from a data frame perspective. Essentially, every row in our data frame is a document. And essentially, if you go horizontally across the data frame, it's a collection of numbers. In mathematical terms, that could be thought of as a vector. If you're a computer programmer, you can think of it as an array. Same idea, right? It's essentially a one-dimensional collection of numbers along the horizontal. So if we can represent things as vectors, then we can also, also think about our documents geometrically. Because vectors are geometric constructs, which means we can think about them in terms of geometry. And this is great because it allows us to take a hypothetical document term frequency matrix such as this one here. And I'm totally making this up, right? It's the simplest thing you can think of. There are only two terms in my corpus of documents. I got bar and foo. That's it. And in this particular document term frequency matrix, you can see here I have three documents and two terms. Document one has six bars and ten foos, so on and so forth. Okay, cool. So if we want to think about this hypothetical matrix geometrically, we actually get something that's highly intuitive. We can visualize it as such. Since we only have two terms, we can actually visualize our documents using a two-dimensional plane, an xy axis. Voila. So on the vertical, I've just mapped the foo-ness, the foo term, to the y axis. And I've just mapped the barness or the bar term, to the x axis. And it was an arbitrary decision on my part. You could reverse that. It doesn't really matter, to be absolutely honest. Now here's the other idea. If we assume. If we assume that all documents start at the origin, 0, 0, right, where the y and x axis cross, we can now plot our documents in this two-dimensional space. So for example, document 1 had 6 bar and 10 foo. So I can plot a point in the vector space here. Let's say this is the point 6, 10. And I can draw a line through it starting with the origin. And that's essentially the vector space representation of document number 1. Pretty simple. Document number two had 10 bar and three foo. Once again, we can create a vector. And the last document, same idea, create a vector. This is super awesome. This gives us a lot of power. First and foremost, we get the ability to, to do some intuition. If you take a look at this, you don't have to have be a mathematician. You don't have to be experienced in text analytics done to just look at this and go, okay, based on this geometric representation, my intuition tells me that document three is more like document one than document two is. And reflexively, document two seems to be more like document three than doc one is. And in fact, your intuition would be exactly correct. The benefit of thinking about our documents using the vector space model geometrically is we can actually take advantage of mathematics. For example, we can, take a, we can use trigonometric functions to analyze, for example, the angles between these documents and understand something about them. Once again, as so often is the case in data science, trigonometry, 
Turns out to be wildly useful. Who knew? Okay. So let's talk specifically about some of the mathematics that we can use. So if we have two vectors, we can use what's known as the dot product to actually do some mathematics on these vectors and understand something about the underlying text. So if you're not familiar with the dot product, we're going to go ahead and go through it. But first and foremost, the reason why we're going to go through it is intuition. Now, since this video series is designed for a very broad audience, we're going to use only as, as, as little math as we need to convey the idea. So we're not going to spend a lot of time spelunking in the mathematics. What we're going to focus on a lot is the intuition. Because to be honest with you, a lot of the mathematics you won't be doing yourself anyway because mo most of it's implemented in the libraries that you use in R. So understanding the intuition is actually far more important. Now, of course, if you always want to go back and learn the underlying mathematics, it is absolutely helpful and useful, but you don't necessarily need it to get started getting business value in your daily work. As long as you have the intuition and you know how to use the libraries, you're going to be able to get business value quickly. Now, if you want to be an expert, obviously you'll need to click down a little bit and understand the mathematics more deeply. Okay, enough said. So here's the mathematical representation. If I have a dot product of two vectors, A and B, the dot product, A dot B, you can see right here, A dot B, A dot B, is simply just go through each one of the vectors. And notice here that the implication is that the vectors have to be the same length, which in our, in our data frame representation is not a problem, right? Every row has 29,200 and something columns. So that's not a problem. Just know that's a requirement. For a dot product, the vectors have to be the same length. So we just go through the vectors one piece at a time, and we say take the first piece of A and the first piece of B, multiply them together. Take the second piece of A, the second piece of B, multiply them together. Add those two things up. And then we just repeat this process over and over and over again. This is the dot product. The intuition, the intuition of this is that you can think of the dot product as a proxy for correlation. A proxy for correlation. The dot product will give you a general indication. It's not exact. That's why I say it's a proxy. It'll give you a general indication of how alike two vectors are. When we talk about cosine similarity later on in the series, cosine similarity is actually a better proxy for correlation, but the dot product is part of the cosine similarity calculation. So you can think of this also as a high-level proxy for uh, correlation, and this is super important, as we'll talk about later when we do um, SVD and LSA. Okay, so what does that mean? So if we take our hypothetical document term frequency matrix that we have here, we can actually calculate some dot products using the mathematical equation above. So first and foremost, here are the calculations for doc1 versus doc2, doc1 and doc3, doc2 and doc3. And you'll notice here that the scores, these calculational scores that we see here, actually match our intuition of what's going on. For example, doc1 and doc2 only have a dot product of 90, but doc1 and doc3 have a dot product of 118. Now, if we go back a slide, that'll make a lot of sense because we'll know, we know that, yeah, just geometrically, this vector is closer to this one. So, yeah, they're probably more similar. This one and this one, the doc1 and doc2 are farther apart. So it makes sense that, in fact, the dot product score would actually be less between doc1 and doc2 than it is between doc1 and doc3. So there you have it. The dot product aligns to our geometric understanding. Notice that the intuition that you had just by looking at the geometric plot actually matches the numbers that you see here of the dot product. So the dot product is going to be super useful conceptually. And we'll see why I'm, I'm belaboring this point in some later slides. Okay, moving on. Since the dot product is useful, it would be nice to be able to calculate the dot products of all the documents all at once. So we can do that using matrix multiplication. Now, if you're not, if you're not familiar with linear algebra or you took linear algebra a long time ago, it's okay. Just follow along. Just try to understand that we can use matrix multiplication to, cre uh, to calculate all the dot products of all the documents all at once. So, and how you would do that is simply saying, look, if I had a uh, hypothetical uh, you know, document term matrix, the dot product of all the docs would be essentially x, if that's my matrix, times the transpose of x. The matrix x times its transpose. So once again, 
given the document term frequency matrix that we're using, this is the mathematics that we get out. Notice how this is just our matrix. This is just our matrix. This is the same as this. Transpose just puts it on its side, right? Columns become columns become rows and rows become columns. Same idea. And then we multiply them together using matrix multiplication. And notice that we'll recognize some of the numbers in here, right? The 90s and the 118s and the 101s. Right? So this row right here essentially represents the dot product for document one. The dot product of document one with itself is 136, but it's only 90 with document two and it's 118 with document three. And we saw those calculations on the previous slide. That's how these all line up. But notice now I can start looking at the matrix all up and start understanding higher level patterns between the correlations between the documents in my matrix. Once again, this is super important, so it bears repeating. The dot product of the documents is indicative of the document correlation given the set of the matrix terms, the matrix terms. So what this is, is this is the correlation of all of my documents with each other given this limited set of terms, bar and foo, bar and foo. Now, obviously, if my documents had other terms in them or more terms other than bar and foo, this would obviously change, right? These mathematics are based on the idea of I've got three documents with only these two terms. As soon as I add more terms, for example, if I add bigram, if I add bigrams, these numbers are going to change by design. But the core idea is the core idea is the same. It shows you the, core, the the relative correlation between documents given the term space. And as we've seen, this is super important because part of what we do to enrich our data frames and text analytics is we manipulate the term space using things like bigrams and trigrams. Okay. Next up. Now, if you want to think about it in this way, the dot products of documents essentially treat the matrix along the horizontal. Right? We take the perspective of, of document, centricity, the horizontal, the rows. But that's not the only way we can think about correlation. We can also think about correlation along the vertical. We can also say, look, you know what? How does the terms actually correlate with each other? Now, as we'll see in a second, given our particular hypothetical example with only two terms, there's not much going on here. But if you had 29,200 and something terms, this may actually be highly useful. So... Once again, we'll use matrix, matrix algebra. And we can see here, all right, we're going to do, to do the, calculate the dot product of all the terms in the document term frequency matrix, we'll do X transpose X. So notice that we've just flipped essentially the X and the X transpose. Once again, here's our hypothetical matrix. And you can see here the mathematics involved. And lastly, you can see, okay, uh, the correlation of bar with itself is 200. The correlation with, with bar and foo is 146. And you can see here that the correlation of foo with itself is 158, given this document term matrix. Now notice, as I said before, this is not super useful with only two terms. But as you, know, as you well know, this is extremely unlikely that we're going to have a very small term space. Your term spaces are going to be very, very large. So this is actually a very useful thing in practice. So again, here's the intuition. The dot product of terms is indicative of term correlation given the set of matrix documents. And this, this should make some intuitive sense, right? If you, think about, if you think about our data in 2D terms, right? Along the rows, I've got my documents. So I can think about the world from a document perspective. What are the, what are the relationships between the documents? But then you can also flip it on its side and say, okay, look, you know what? I'm actually going to take a term centricity and say, look, what terms have high correlation. And let me use an intuitive example. Foo and bar is a bit abstract. But how about, for example, the idea of the words, the terms, loan, credit card, and debt. Let's say I work in the financial services space and I'm analyzing textual documents and financial services. It's probably likely that those terms are highly correlated. They probably show up a lot in the same types of documents. So that gives you an idea that this the, looking at it from a term perspective may also be potentially interesting as well because at a certain level, maybe, just maybe, the idea of credit cards, the idea of loans, and the idea of debts are all synonymous. Or there may be advantages of me essentially collapsing those three columns down into a single column that represents some higher level concept related to debt. This, this, this is a key intuition, as we'll see later. This is a key idea behind 
latent semantic analysis, this core idea of saying, look, maybe I can actually collapse those three things down into a single column and actually get more signal out of my data. But more on that later. Okay. Okay, LSA, latent semantic an analysis. So here's the intuition. I would like to be able to extract relationships between documents and terms, assuming, assuming that terms that are close in meaning will appear in similar, i.e. correlated, pieces of text. This is just a fancy way of saying what I just said on the previous slide, using the example of credit cards, loans, and debt. It would be nice to be able to say, okay, look, is there some sort of probabilistic mechanism, some sort of mathematical way of saying, look, based on the correlation of how certain terms appear across all of the documents in my corpus, can I essentially extract out core concepts that aren't actually manifest in the document? For example, the idea that loans, credit card, and debt are all basically ideas of debt in this particular corpus. So instead of having three conceptual distinct ideas, can I merge them into one higher level relationship construct, mathematically, mathematically represented? That's the intuition. So the answer is yes, obviously. It works. There's a, there's, a, there's a name for it, LSA. So obviously it works. The implementation is what uh, uses what is known as a singular value decomposition, an SVD. And an SVD is a factorization, which essentially means it's a way of decomposing a matrix. You take a matrix, a, a table, if you will, uh, that you've created. Maybe it's unigrams and bigrams, and it's all TFIDF to awesomeness. And then you say, look, I want to decompose it. I want to actually break that down into smaller chunks using a strict mathematical f just uh, formula algorithm that then provides me with certain benefits. And in fact, when you apply LSA to a term document matrix, you actually do exactly this. You extract out the relationships that we got from our intuition. For Once again, for example, credit card, loans, and debt actually transform into a higher level relational construct. You may not recognize it, it may not be human recognizable, but the mathematics pulls it out for you automagically, and this is cool. Now, one thing I do need to note here, though, is that um, the mathematics here are gonna get a little, bit, a little bit more complicated than what we saw in the dot product. Once again, stick with me, bear with the intuition. Most of the time, you're not gonna need to implement this code directly. You will use libraries that will help you out, but understanding the intuition is important. The other thing I should note as well is that we'll need to transpose our matrix. Because notice that here, singular value decomposition of a term document matrix. Term document matrix. Because notice, so far we've been working with a document term matrix. Documents are the rows, terms are the columns. Everything that you see in the literature, for example, if you go to Wikipedia and you look up latent semantic analysis, is going to assume actually a term document matrix. And just for the sake of the sanity of people watching this video, since all the documentation that you find on the internet uses a term document matrix, I will actually show you in the code, the R code, assuming a term document matrix, even though so far we've actually been assuming a document term matrix. That's just, just for your sanity. So if you go look it up, then you'll understand the code a little bit better. So just, may, just be aware that we'll need to transpose our matrix. Okay. So... Here's the thing, the SVD of our term document matrix, our term document matrix is equal to a matrix called U, this thing called sigma, and a transpose of a matrix of V. Now, that doesn't really, that's not super helpful, so let's talk a little bit about what these constituent pieces mean. So, the matrix U contains the eigenvectors of the term correlations, that is, x times x transpose. Now notice that these are notice that these are opposite from what we saw on the previous slide because again we're working with the transpose of our matrix, right? We're working with the transpose, that's why they're opposite. And v contains the eigenvectors of the document correlations. But this is what's super important. Ignore ignore this, ignore this, ignore this fancy eigenvector thing. To say look, this matrix, whoops, excuse me. This matrix can this matrix U contains the term correlations, and this matrix V contains the document correlations at higher levels of abstraction. I'm extracting relationships, semantic relationships, out of the documents. 
So this isn't the, the term by term correlations. These are a reduced set. Once again, using the previous example, this isn't credit cards, loans, and debt. It is a combination of the three as a higher level construct, which is super cool because notice that not only have I reduced the number of columns in my hypothetical example, but I've also increased the signal in the column. And this is awesome, right? I'm getting a double whammy here. And then lastly, sigma contains the singular values. And we'll talk a little bit more about what that means here in a bit. Okay, so not surprisingly, LSA to the rescue. So LSA often remediates. Now I say often because not always. As I said, look, it depends. Generally speaking, you're going to use SVD quite a bit, but it won't always help you out. Not always, but most of the time it will. So the matrix factorization has the effect of combining columns. And as I said, that has the effect of not only reducing your dimensionality, but also potentially enriching the signal in your data. Not surprisingly, you can actually use LSA to dramatically reduce your dimensionality. For example, it's very common to use several hundred columns in your LSA, in your LSA. So we will go from over 29,000 columns to about 300. So this is great, right? Dramatically reduces your feature space. Now, as always in machine learning and data science, there is no free lunch. There's always some sort of trade-off. Performing the SVD factorization is computationally intensive, as we'll see in the next video. It takes quite a while. Now, here's the other thing. The reduced matrices, right? these, these higher level abstractions, right? This, this combination of credit cards and loans and debt into a single column, these reduced factorized, factorized matrices, these quote unquote semantic spaces are approximations. They are approximations. So they won't be exact. You're going, you're going to get a little bit of, of information loss. But the idea is, is that the combining of, for example, credit cards, loans, and debt into a single column, even though it's an approximation, the combination of those three things actually adds way more signal than you lose by it being an approximation. So you get a net gain. That's the idea. And then lastly, and this is super important because we talked about this with TFIDF, is that once again, we'll need to project the new data into the semantic space. Now, hopefully, you're starting to understand why this is super important, why I've, I've made a big deal of this in previous videos. When you think about the vector space model and you start doing these transformations, either TF-IDF or bigrams or, or even LSA for that matter, you, you start to remember, okay, look, if I train my model based on these vector space transformations, it only understands things that have been translated into that vector space. Ergo, that means any new data that comes in, I have to be able to manipulate the data, transform it, and then present it into that same vector space. And if I can't, then the model's not gonna understand what's going on and it won't create good predictions or maybe not create predictions at all. So that's why it's super important. And we'll see how to do this in the video series so you'll know how to do it in your own work. So, not surprisingly, SVD is effective and is a staple of text analytics pipelines. It's almost, it's almost essentially de facto default. So at a high level, uh, what do I do? I lowercase, I tokenize, I stem, I remove stop words, I do TFIDF and I SVD. All those things are pretty standard because generally speaking, most of the time it produces very, very good results. Very, very good results. Okay, lastly, let's talk about how we project new data. So how we do that is, as we said before, we're gonna to have to do a bunch of manipulations on the data. So it's, it's, it's useful to talk about this process at a high level. So here is our high level process for projection. Not surprisingly, after we create our tokens, right? After we tokenize, whether we create unigrams or bigrams, we remove stop words, stemming, whatever, that process, assuming that that's already done, the first thing that we do is we normalize the document vector. We normalize the rows using our term frequency function, which we saw earlier, okay? Then after that, we have to complete the TFIDF projection using the TFIDF function. Because remember, we cached our TFIDF values and now we're gonna use those to normalize any brand new data into that space. Now right now, our training data is done. That's cool. But when we talk about the test data, when we talk about data that flows in from the production system once we go live, this is the process that we'll have to follow. We'll have to tokenize, we'll have to bigram, trigram, whatever we're doing. And then we'll have to do the TDF-IDF projection. And then lastly, the last projection we'll need to do is the SVD projection. 
because as we'll see, we are going to reduce our TFIDF columns from over 29,000 down to 300. So any new data that we work with has to follow exactly the same exact process, otherwise our model won't understand what's going on. Okay, and here's the mathematics for doing the SVD projection. So D hat represents our transform document, our projected document, the final thing that we actually create our predictions on. D in this math here, D in this math here represents the TFIDF projected document. It's been tokenized, it's been stemmed, it's been stop word removed and lower cased, and then it's been bigram, trigram, whatever, and then it's been TFIDF'd. And then lastly, we multiply that document rec vector, that row, by the U matrix transposed and that by the sigma values inverted. And that will give you the new document projected down into that 300 column space. Now, once again, if the math is a little bit wonky for you, don't worry about it, it's okay. We'll see this implemented in code in the next video. Okay, there you have it. You've learned quite a bit today in this video. You've learned about the vector space model. You've learned about dot products as a proxy for correlation between documents. You've learned about the mighty LSA, latent semantic analysis. In particular, you've learned about LSA's implementation using singular value decomposition. These are all very valuable tools that will drive your text analytics projects to the highest levels of effectiveness possible. Okay, so until next time, this is Dave Langer signing off. If you like what we're doing here on Data Science Dojo's YouTube channel, please subscribe. We'll be publishing new video content, new tutorials weekly. More generally, if you like what we're doing at Data Science Dojo, feel free to follow us on social media, whether that be Facebook or uh, LinkedIn or Twitter, what have you. And we provide lots of curated data science content for folks that are interested in learning more about the space. Also, if you have any questions, any questions at all, please use the comments section on the YouTube page for the video. We do monitor our YouTube channel on a regular basis and try to answer any and all questions promptly. And lastly, I hope to see you in an upcoming Data Science Dojo Bootcamp.